Good morning and welcome to worship. I am delighted that you're here. It's a wonderful day to be together in the house of the Lord. We have a guest preacher today, Dr. Dan Holloway. We were talking a few minutes ago about both serving in South Carolina at the same time. He was at the Unity Church in Fort Mill, and he tells me we will hear about that in worship today. But it has been a delight to get to know Dan. He's been a wonderful coach and mentor and consultant for our session and for this church. I'm glad you're here. There are yellow friendship cards that are in the pews. If you're a visitor with us or if you've never filled one of these out, we'd love to know your presence and let you fill that out and share that with us. Uh, there are offering plates in the back of the church as we leave. That's when and where we do the offering now. Folks also give online or they set up automatic bank drafts. There are lots of ways to give to the church and you're gonna hear about that in just a minute from one of our elders. I encourage you to read all of our announcements. They're all important. And to note all of these, the men's breakfast that's coming up on Tuesday, I didn't wear my name badge, but I hope you all are wearing yours. Um, it's hard to be the preacher and do everything else, or I'm not preaching today, we have a guest. I just returned from vacation, so if my mind is still in a different time zone, please forgive me. In our Lord's Supper worship today, there was a slight mistake in the bulletin, I was not here. The book of Revelation tells us that in heaven right now, the angels and the elders and the living creatures are all bowing down before God and saying, singing, holy, holy, holy. I want us to do that. It's hymn number one in our hymnal. So we're going to greet one another at the Lord's table. I'm going to have a prayer. And then we're going to sing with the angels in heaven as they sing and we sing, holy, holy, holy. We'll sing verse 1 of hymn 1. We will not also say it as it's printed in bold there on the bulletin. So just follow me. I'll announce that we can remain seated as we sing with the angels. And then we'll have our Lord's Supper. All of you are invited to be a part of our Lord's Supper. It's not a Presbyterian table, even a Protestant table. If you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're welcome We'll come down the center aisle, take the bread and the cup. If you need to take that now, you, you may, so you don't spill, or you may take the bread and the juice back to your seats and consume it then. But we'll walk down the center aisle and, and back to our seats. Mary, I think you're going to share an announcement with us. You may go to either full of uh, lecture. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Mary Damon. I've been a member of this church for over 25 years. Um, I love this church. I love God. Um, and I'm really impressed to see this many people here. If you're a football fan, yesterday was an incredible day of football, and I'm exhausted. I stayed up till the very end of the LSU Alabama game, and we it's, it was just a big day. But um, but now I'm here to talk to you about something really exciting, money. <laughs> so um, some of you may, you, you have in your bulletin a flyer um, that describes all the different ways you can contribute. Um, as a member of the finance committee, we decided it's been confusing with, you know, we don't pass the plate anymore, but there's a lot of options. Um, you can still do, of course, the basic en envelope, which I still do, but, um, and you can go give online. Um, you can do online giving through your bank. You can either do a bill pay or call your bank, um, or you can mail a check. But we just put it all in writing because we thought that we kind of take it for granted sometimes that everybody knows all this stuff. So just, just gives you a little guide. Um, there's also some giving strategies that we put at the bottom. Um, I just want to point out one in particular. It's called the Qualified Charitable Distribution. It's a distribution from your IRA, and you must be 70 and a half years old to partake in that. And there's a lot of rules on that, but it's a really, really good way to get money out of your IRA tax-free. 
Um, I would suggest you talk to either your financial advisor or tax preparer to set that up. Um, I do know a little bit about it, I'm a CPA, but um, if you know, I can answer basic questions, I'd be glad to. But um, I just want to thank this congregation. Um, you're always so generous and you always share your time and talents so graciously with all those, especially those um, that are less fortunate than us. And I just, um, just thank you. And if I can ever answer any questions, um, uh, there's several of the finance committee here. I know Jim Nancy and, and um, Jeff Baker, I'm not sure if he's here, but um, Vicki in the choir. Um, we'd all always be willing to answer any questions you may have. Thank you.
of silent confession and the assurance of pardon, you may turn to folks around you and say, the peace of Christ be with you, or just peace, or just give the peace sign. It's not the time to run around and shake hands with everybody, even though we love each other. Let's, let's confess our sins. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive us our disrespectful name, for our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us consuming by our judgment. Set us free from the past that we may not change, open to us the future in which we can be changed, and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image, through Jesus Christ. Dear friends, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. You look really pretty today. Good morning. Whatever I, I do, but I...
several weeks ago before my vacation. I had such a restful vacation that I didn't think about church at all except to pray for y'all. I prayed for the church every day, for people on my prayer list. Other than that, I didn't think of you. But the psalm said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Can you think of all that is within you, your mind and your heart and your eyes and your thoughts? Everything that's within me. I also think about the raisin bran that's in my belly that I had for <laughs> breakfast. And that's the, the song we often pray in the middle of the meal. If we've had, um, we've begun to eat, and then we pray the 103rd Psalm, bless the Lord and all that is within me, bless his holy name. What else is within us? Our thoughts, those whom we love, the things that we have to work with. Friends and family. Yes, all that is within us, praise the Lord. We praise God in many ways. When we sing, when we pray, actually, how we treat people at school, how we treat our brothers and sisters, our parents and grandparents. Are we kind to them? Is everything we do Praising the Lord. So that's our children's sermon for today. Thinking about that together. Praising God with our whole selves. All that is within us. Everybody we meet. Do we love them? Do we think kind thoughts about them? Do we act loving and kindly? Let's have a prayer and I'll say a line and then everybody repeat that line please. Dear God. Yeah. Help us to praise you, Help us to praise you. With, everything with everything we are. We do praise you, we do praise you. in Jesus' name. Message from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, 
through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. This is the word of the Lord. surveys, listening sessions, prayer, and of course in so many other ways. That work is now continuing and I am very grateful for the invitation to remain as your work partner in that. These processes are not always smooth, of course. Sometimes there are unexpected twists and turns. And yet I have come today to say that even when that has been the case, I am deeply hopeful about the future of this congregation. I believe you have every reason in the world to anticipate a future where you will play a key role in the work of God's kingdom. You have every reason to be hopeful. As Christians, we are, of course, called to live in a posture of hope. But I also understand that it's not always that easy to do. And so what I want us to do today is to talk about what hope is 
and also what it isn't. And I especially want us to focus on the kind of hope that God provides. Today I want to talk about biblical hope, the kind that comes through the Apostle Paul's words to us today. Now I suspect that most of us would agree in principle that hope is a wonderful thing. Lewis Smeads writes of the power of hope in his book, Standing on the Promises, when he offers these words. Has any mason ever put brick to mortar without hope of eventually building a wall? Has any writer ever put a word to paper without hoping more and better words would follow? Has any entrepreneur ever begun a project without hoping to put it into production and success? Has any addicted person ever broken her addiction without the hope that she could do so? And have any two persons healed their broken marriage without the hope that there was something there worth saving? At some base level, we all know that hope is a wondrous gift that can make all the difference in our lives. And yet, if we are honest, we also admit that sometimes hope can be a bit fleeting these days. A church in Atlanta was approaching the season of Advent, and in anticipation of the lighting of the Advent candle of hope, the pastor invited all the members of that church to submit to him images of hope that they had found hopeful, and lots of folks took him up on this invitation, and there were some wonderfully nice answers. One person said, hope looks like the brightening of the horizon as the sun begins to rise. Hope. It was like a warm coat hanging on a coat rack before you stepped out into the bitter cold. Hope looks like a baking pan filled with good things being placed into a preheated oven. Hope looks like a genuine smile offered when you step into a room. Hope looks like those first tentative steps taken with a physical therapist after enduring a major surgery. Hope looks like vaccine shots for my children. Hope looks like another month's worth of rent is actually in hand. Hope looks like walking into my church and knowing that these are my people. Really nice answers, weren't they? But one woman honestly said this. You ask Pastor what I'm hopeful about these days can't think of anything right now. I'm feeling pretty hopeless. Well, I am glad that she was willing to be honest. And I'd be willing to bet that she was not the only one in that church that was feeling that way. I'm confident with all the unending violence in recent weeks, with the ongoing cultural and political wars, with the loss of trust in many of our leaders and institutions, Many of us may be wondering about this whole concept of hope. We can't have an honest conversation about it without just saying sometimes it's really, really difficult. And yet we have these words from Scripture, words that speak with confidence about hope. So where did Paul come up with these words? Well, it's not because everything was perfect in Rome, not by any means. Paul was writing to a group of Christians for whom hope was likely in very short supply. As Scott Posey reminds us in his commentary, they lived in the heart of Roman darkness, right under the nose of the Caesar himself. They lived in an empire in which that same Caesar was declared Deus et Dominus, God and Lord, on every coin in their pockets. What's more, the regime was increasingly hostile to this new Christian faith and would put to death many, many Christians, including the one writing this letter. And it's not even like Paul's life had been all smoothed up until that point. When you remember his time in prison, when you think about the opponents who were out to destroy him, when you remember that thrown in the flesh that he spoke of and that he so much wanted to be rid of, it's a pretty remarkable thing that that same Paul writes these words about hope. So how does that happen? Well, it seems to me that a couple of things are required to come to trust the kind of hope in which Paul himself believed. Number one, we have to understand what hope is and what it's not. 
Now you see, people sometimes confuse hope and optimism, but they are, in fact, two very different things. Now this is to say that optimism is a bad thing. Frankly, we could use a few more optimists in this country these days, people who have the capacity to see the world as all right, or at least hopeful in some way. What I instead see are increasing numbers of the Eeyores. You remember the Eeyores, don't you? That pessimistic donkey from the Winnie the Pooh series. After more than 40 years of church leadership, I have learned that the Eeyores among us can absolutely destroy the spirit of a club, a church, or a nation. And there are way too many Eeyores around these days. So let me say to you very quickly and bluntly, I hope that there are some optimists here in this room today that we need optimism in our life. And yet it must also be said that hope is not the same thing as optimism. Optimism comes from the same root word as optics, which has to do with the eye and what you can see. And let's be honest, what we can often see these days can be incredibly confusing or hard. When you look at the grieving faces of those left behind in Buffalo or Uvalde or Raleigh or you name the place these days, it is sometimes hard to see hope. When you look at the bombed out landscape of the Ukraine, it's hard to see sometimes much reason for optimism. To read the latest numbers on church attendance in many places is frankly to become a little bit discouraged. All that is obvious to the eyes in such places is pain and grief. Let's be clear that optimism is not always easy in our time and sometimes times we just can't truthfully be quite optimistic. Instead, then, what we need is hope. What we need is the capacity to imagine a world where things can be different, where our current pain is not the final word. One man said it this way in his blog, especially when you're struggling, you need to hear words of hope. You need to hear not just this shall pass, but in fact, things can be better, and by God's power, things one day will be better. This is hope. It is the recognition that our current moment, our current pain, does not have the final word. And this is what the Church of Jesus Christ needs to hear today. This is the good news of our faith. By God's grace, by God's power, there will be a future. There will be hope. Walk mentioned I served a church for a very long time, actually, 29 years, Unity Presbyterian Church in Fort Bell, South Carolina. They suffered a devastating fire about four years ago now that did more than $3 million worth of damage to the property, damaging a number of buildings, including the historic sanctuary built in 1881. Mm -hmm. While the church has built a new sanctuary in the last few years because they are growing so much up that way, the historic sanctuary still served as a centerpiece of the campus and as a place of gratitude and memory for so many longtime members. It was a place that still hosted a number of smaller funerals and weddings. Indeed, our daughter got married in that building, and I led worship there for more than 20 years. And so I had pretty strong feelings about that space myself. And when I went out to see what had happened in the fire, all I can tell you is I was literally sick to my stomach. Well, the decision was made to save the historic building, if at all possible. And by the grace of God and some absolutely remarkable architectural work, they were able to do that. From the outside of the sanctuary, it looks now much like it did before the fire came. You'd never know it had been through such a terrible ordeal. But the big question was what to do with this building now that it had been kind of put back together again. And the decision was eventually made to turn it into a flexible ministry center that could be used for a wide variety of purposes, and that is exactly what has happened. Well, it still looks like the historic sanctuary on the outside and the stained glass windows that are beautiful are still there. It is now used for gatherings of all kinds of things for God's purposes these days. 
Well, my wife Carol and I finally got to go back about three months ago and look at this for the first time since the renovation was completed. Imagine our delight when we walked into that former sanctuary with the stained glass windows still intact, but seeing it busy and being used and just a wonderful place of hospitality. And they also did something really smart. They hung on the walls where there were not stained glass windows, paintings and pictures that recall the life of that space as a sanctuary throughout its remarkable history. And so to walk around that space these days is to walk through the history of that building. So Carol and I were walking around this room and looking at the pictures and the paintings and we're smiling and remembering all these wonderful events that took place there. And I come to this one picture and it totally stops me in my tracks. It's a picture of me as a young pastor with a lot more hair <laughs> and a lot less gray sitting on the floor of the sanctuary with the children for our children's time in worship. And at that moment, as I'm standing there looking at this picture of me much many years ago, one of the children who used to come down for those children's messages, who has now grown up, whose name, if you believe this, is Daniel, came and stood beside me. And we looked at that picture together for several minutes, it seemed like. And then Daniel said to me, hey, Dr. Holloway, did you know that I am now a deacon in this church? A deacon? When this kid was growing up, I wasn't even sure he'd make it to be an adult. <laughs> <laughs> Much less a deacon in the church. And here he was, Daniel, in that former sanctuary now restored, giving testimony to the power of God. And my eyes began to water, and he put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, it's okay, Dr. Holloway, it's all good. God's got this. Life changes, but life goes on. Your life as a congregation has been through challenges too, but your life will go on. Will it be different in some ways? I'm confident that it will be, but your life will go on, and that is what happens when we rightfully believe in hope. May that hope fill your hearts today and forever. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, In my prayer of communion, I want to remember Pat Bishop. We had a message from her in Sunday school this morning that the radiation's finished and she's feeling better. She's still going through some difficulties, and we want to keep praying for her, uh, pray for Jamie Scott and others in the church. I understand while I was on vacation, Jamie Hutchinson passed away. I don't know any details, and I will meet with her sons and we'll make a plan for her service. Indeed, God's got this. God's got us. I like the image of the whole world in his hands. It is our Lord Jesus whose hands broke the bread and shared it with his disciples. He said to them, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Those very same hands that a day or so later, would be stretched out on the cross. And also reminds me of Jesus having the whole world in his hands, dying for us. We remember that in this meal. And that's the meal that I invite you to this morning. Let's pray again. We're not going to say that last part that's in bold with the Holy Holy. We're going to sing it. Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Indeed, O oh Lord, we come giving you our thanks and praise. We're grateful for this day. 
for being here in hope, grateful for this church, for the message that's been preached here for 165 years, the message of the gospel that we proclaim again this morning, the gospel that gives us hope. And with the angels in heaven, we sing together, holy, holy, holy.
you, Lord Jesus, for sharing this meal of your body and blood with us. We're grateful for all that it means and all that it symbolizes. We pray for the congregation, for our elders who will meet this afternoon, for this congregation. In Jesus' name, amen. And we'll close with our last hymn. Thank you.